Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. Neil here again with bikepacking.com. And in today's episode, we chat with Dusty Arrow. Dusty has been working with Revelate Designs for just about 10 years now. In this interview, we chat about the R&D, specifically about the pronghorn, a bag he helped design. We talk about uh, his business that he just started with his wife, as well as his alpine career. Dusty was a pleasure to chat with, and it was really interesting to hear how he had zero bikepacking or uh, sewing experience before he started with Revelate Designs. And now he helps design many of the bags that you all use today. So if you like what you hear today, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Thanks so much and enjoy the interview. All right, Dusty, well, thanks so much for joining us and congrats, uh, you are recently uh, married. What, uh, when when did that happen? Uh, That was July 3rd this year, yep. And uh, we, yeah, canceled, rescheduled, canceled, and then, uh, yeah, made a, uh, we're able to pull off a COVID wedding this year. That's an achievement. (laughs) It's not easy to do. You know, it. It was, but it worked out even better than if we had planned it perfectly because we had a great, great secondary location, good view. It was like right where we, you know, pretty close to where we live. So we were able to actually ride back from the ceremony to our reception at our house. So, yeah, it was it was, it was a lot of fun. And I think the last time we chatted, was it in 2018? Were we at Parker Canyon Lake? Yeah, I, I got a ride down with, with Kurt and Caitlin to the start of the, the 750. So yeah, I met you there. And then uh, we we're sp- I, guess, I guess we were supposed to connect at the Dirty Kansas, but you had, you had it sounded like you had a crash that year. I fell, yeah. So. It was last year only. It's crazy. That year, 2018, you, did, you finished the Arizona Trail and you got second behind Kurt. Um, you want to just way, touch, way on, touch on that? Well, yeah, maybe it, it was like a day and a half or something like that. Uh, it, no, that was, that was like my first big, I mean, I had done a bunch of like endurance races up here in Alaska, but, uh, you know, they were like 250 mile races versus that. So that was, that was my first big, um, I guess, ultra endurance bike packing race. And yeah, I don't know. I was just, I like Arizona trails. They were so like I've only ridden a few of them before then. And so yeah, pretty stoked to just fly down and do that. The only problem is like, we don't, that's not even my mountain bike season yet. In Alaska. So we were still on snow. So I hadn't even ridden dirt yet until like basically flying down to Arizona to start. So yeah, that's hard to, it's hard to prepare for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had no, I think actually it might've been better that I didn't really know what to expect because I wasn't, wasn't uh, aware of the beat down that I was about to get. <laughs> well, and and the learning curve, like it takes you a few rides to get used to skinny tires after riding four or five inch tires all winter. Oh yeah, totally. Bit of a challenge. I, I remember um, I threw my like 29ers, you know, wheel set on there and like the suspension fork and it's still, you know, fr- we had cross biking at the time, which means it like melts and then freezes in, in the, or still, still frozen in the morning. So I was out there with like studded tires and 29 inch, like, biking the snow single track to like just get a feel for what it was like and then I remember I was like really wondering how it was all going to work with the uh, the hike a bike section through the Grand Canyon so like I made this um, carry system that I had like I so yeah I actually made this carry system and then uh, I remember I'd bike to this trailhead and then there's this big uphill and I'd like in the snow and like I'd break the bike down and put it on my back and I remember hiking up in the snow to like practice carrying the bike to see if it would work. It was, it was fun. I'd love to do it again. I, I really liked that trail. It was a it was a great ride. I guess let's let's jump right into Revelate and kind of your history with the company. That's kind of what I'm really anxious to hear about just because you've worked with them for such a long time. You've designed so many different bags. What's the difference uh post uh, pre-covid and now post-covid like how busy have you guys been it was busy before but honestly like we had a little bit of a lull when kind of covid started and then i i mean i think we're on par with everybody else in the bike industry it's just been it's been super busy trying to keep up with you know what we had on our plate and then the the more recent like kind of boom and demand for it um has been good and it you know it's also busy in the, the sense that there there are some delays you know with production side of things as far as material delays and everything else that's been affected but yeah definitely a learning curve like we're working 
fairly remote. I'm, I kind of can work somewhat remote, but I have to come into the shop. But fortunately, I'm usually the only one here working, so we can keep our distance. Um, Eric comes in, you know, to do to do work as well. Um, yeah, no, it's been it's been kind of crazy with the whole COVID thing. It was not what I expected in any way. Yeah, I don't think anybody was. <laughs> It must have been like the perfect storm, I guess, of like people having to stay close to home and being able to go outside, but not really being indoors. So, yeah, maybe it finally forced a realization that people can do fun things around their house and or around their home and be out on a bike. So it's kind of awesome to see. Um, all right. So, yeah, you've been with Revelate for, it. I think it'll almost be 10 years in December. I don't know exactly when you got hired, but I was doing some research. and wow. Yeah, it's been a decade, I guess. Yeah. So what uh, what did you get hired to do uh, 10 years ago? What did Eric hire you? You were his first employee, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so first employee, only employee for a while. Uh, it was kind of funny how it all worked. Um, so I was going to school at the time and... Uh, I needed work just, and I was, I wasn't really much of a biker at that point. I mean, I was a climber. Um, like I just liked alpine climbing and that was kind of my thing. And my professor who's good friends with Eric knew that Eric needed a job cause or not, not needed a job, needed somebody to help him. Cause Eric was doing this all by himself at this point. And then, uh, he had, uh, he had just had his son. So I think his son was like two or three months old at this point and he's like I needed help so my professor actually got me the job and uh, um, I went in there and it was just like it was a pretty funny interview because it was like oh do you want a job I was like sure it's like what what do you do like what are we doing here um, which oh there he is right now actually oh nice so, uh, <clears throat> yeah so I uh, came in and then he was like well I'm gonna have you do it I'm doing an interview right now with the uh, Neil so Neil! Hey! <laughs> oh, there it What's is. What's up? How's it going? <laughs> Good, you? Good. I'm stealing your employee for like an hour. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> Good. Good Thanks to see you. Yeah, you too. Oh, man, where was I? <laughs> oh, yeah, so we, we, I came in. I, I It was like the middle of the winter. Came to his uh, the, the shop, which was actually just the detached garage. And... Uh, yeah, he's like, yeah, you'll be kind of shipping stuff and maybe some sewing and we'll just see what happens. Started off just shipping packages and then it was like answering emails and then I was sewing or, you know, helping these sub assemblies for these random parts and pieces that I had absolutely no idea what they were going to. And then it all kind of evolved from there a little bit. But yeah, starting out was kind of, it was funny. It was just like part time. I'd be in there, I'd ship stuff. You know, he had his son on his chest on this little like baby carrier thing trying to sew and like we couldn't listen to any music so we had like whale songs playing in the background yeah it was good obviously you've done quite a bit since then but what's the role that you're in now what are you doing mostly um so it you know it kind of evolves a little bit from day to day depending on what it needs because we're a pretty small company i don't know if people realize how small but yeah there's only like three of us including eric full-time working operations Right now, I'm I'm busy doing the majority of my stuff is getting uh, the production shop ready with all the patterns to make sure that they're good to go with future orders, producing all the materials. So it's like I'll do material purchasing. Um, I proof the patterns to make sure everything's good with that material usage. That takes up quite a bit of my time right now. And then on the other side of things is just either R and D or tweaking products that we have out there making adjustments um like i said at the moment since since we've had like such a boom it's mainly just making sure the production's good to go and they have everything they need and then once that's kind of settled out then i go back to to working on uh you know different bag projects and your production crew that's in oregon is that right um we've got a couple places that's that spread the load the majority of the stuff yes is in is in oregon yeah, we have other locations, so it's it's always a juggling match to get everything shipped in the right spot. And is that a decision based on trying to 
make it easier to distribute throughout the United States? Obviously, being up in Alaska, you're kind of tucked away there. I'm just wondering if that was like a business decision made a while ago or... We actually used to do everything here, even though it was being, you know, we did produce a lot in Alaska for quite a while, like even in the garage um, days, you know, and then when we had the majority down in Oregon still, it's like, it's such a time delay to ship it all up here and then ship it out. And plus the expense of having it shipped to Alaska and then shipping it out. So it just made a whole lot more sense to have it all centralized down in that area. So even our like fulfillment center that we send to is on the West coast. So there's a lot, there's not a lot of time delay to get it from like production to, you know, where it can be distributed. Let's talk about R and D because I know you've you've designed a few bags. Uh, what bags have you designed from the ground up? The pronghorn was my my design. The recent ones are like the Joey down tube bag. I guess the hopper, the the magnetic zipperless frame bag. The newly released uh, wallet that we have, the tool cache. Those those are definitely ground up ones. Um, I do a lot of the. Um, the co-branded stuff so when we have like co-branded frame bags one that was really cool actually that i think got left off the radar but it was a fun bag was the old cogburn frame bags oh yeah 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 but it had this cool like arching zipper panel opening it's, yeah it was super cool um interesting way to get that zipper to arch it was a really fun project but but i end up doing a lot of like the you know we'll redesign stuff like i did the oh the wall pack i did the the hydration pack was mine too um yeah like the redesign of the, the the mountain feed bag which we've had on our you know we've had it for years and years and i can't take credit for designing it eric and i have definitely kick ideas back and forth on everything so do you guys just like drink a beer after work one day and be like you know what i think this is this is something we need to really focus our time in is that like how an idea is born or is it just is it through people's requests sometimes it might come in as a request but like the majority of it comes in from like being out on like a trip or something like the the idea of it at least you know or like the aha moment of like oh we need to really do this and yeah i think it's like out of necessity like the nano pinners for instance like you know eric was leaving on a trip for the for to do, tour on the iditarod trail like going from mcgrath back and it was like He's like, oh, I need like a winter pannier. So it's like, that's kind of how that came about. And for me, like with the pronghorn, it was like, I wanted something lighter because I, I wanted to remove the dry bag. And <clears throat> like we, you know, we have the harness, but I wanted it to be a little bit simpler and uh, more race oriented. So it's like, that's what I wanted out there. So that's kind of how that product evolved. A lot of it's just based on our needs. And then we listen to customers and, um, ambassadors and pulling ideas from everybody but you know it, it's funny it's not like a shark tank where we sit down and try to figure out like we're like what do we need next what's going on next uh, um yeah mainly it just comes from something that we are not seeing on the market or we personally wanted to have the whole catalog from revelates like evolved but it's also stayed pretty simple and i think you guys have done a really good job of just staying true to the things that you already have and updating them like that feed bag is a great example because that's like one of my top favorite bags because of how easy it is to open and close now. And we've all used the the first generation, but it just got better. So that's something I definitely appreciate. So I guess for, for the pronghorn, let's take that for an example. How many trials or how many prototypes do you think you would have to go through to get, or how many did you go through to get to the point it is uh, at now? A finished product yeah that one's kind of funny because it seems like all these bags seem super simple in the end but they ended up like just being like so many iterations of them i think there might have been like 30 or 40 like different holster samples that i had laying around and you know i, I would think that i'm like oh this is it i've got it this is perfect and then uh, just ended up tweaking something which changes the whole thing and it's like the last thing you want to do is send your proofed patterns and everything into production and then be like, no, wait, hold on, hold on. I want to change something. So that, that the pronghorn actually, it's actually been on the kind of trial and error for quite a while. Um, I'm trying to think back. It could have been a few years actually, um, because I remember taking some of the first samples when I did the Oregon timber trail. And that was the first, we were like the fourth and fifth people to finish the timber trail so 
you know, from the, then till when we released it, which was two years ago, I think. I mean, that was that was a while. It was a few years in planning for it. And um, yeah, it's you look at the product and you're like, oh, it's so simple. But it's it just uh, there's just a lot of like tolerances and placement of everything and how to make it production friendly. That just took a lot of I guess time. And then I wasn't happy with it until it was like perfect. So it was kind of partly me being OCD about it. It's a great bag, by the way. The easiest handlebar bag I've used. It's durable. It's simple. That's why I think a lot of people love it. One more follow-up question to that is like when you were like, all right, this is it. What's the process after that then? You've got the templates to build and then you send those to production. Basically, it's like you, you get it to the point where like you think it's ready for production and like that means like you've made a, t a bunch of them and you've worked out all the bugs that possibly could take into place um the patterns are correct like um uh, you know and we're i'm really old school i'm terrible at like cad work so like i do all the stuff by hand and um the you know cad everybody's like oh well you could like maybe see what the outside perimeter is and you get all these measurements but I don't know, working with the fabric, at different different fabrics change, so it's like you gotta make sure the stretch is right. And so after you've done all that, you've got your perfect pattern. For us at least, and I'm sure it varies from you know company to company, I'll send it to our production. We'll make sure that uh, they give us a production sample. We figure out costing on it. We have a bill of materials. From there, it's just like making sure that they've got all the materials in-house to do it. And then we start the process from there. And like just that alone could take, you know, several months to to finally release it. Because then after that, it's like after it goes through production, I'm kind of like I, I step back a little bit. And then Eric and Holly like kind of take over with a lot of that sort of thing, get photos, getting it up on the website, and then um it kind of goes from there, but it's it turns into a lot longer process than you <clears throat> think of having this complete, like ready to go product. It's kind of interesting, and there's always back and forth. Like um, production might be not, they might have a different way of doing it, and they, you know, so it's just a lot of approval back and forth to make sure that it's you know the product that you want it to be out there in people's hands. What is like the time frame that you would then test the product after you get it from production and and kind of put it through the ringer the testings should be done before production so before because production's like okay it's it's ready to roll so all the testing's done beforehand you know with the finished samples by the time it gets to production it's one of those things where it's like it, it's rolling you know and it's going it's going to go out the door all the sampling like i i will try to take out the samples as you know after i finish one i'm like yeah this is it and i'll take it i'll load it up and we'll go ride and sometimes it's like yeah sometimes i'll take it on a trip or sometimes i'll use it on like a race or something there's been a few times where i've taken sample bags on races um i just don't want it to fall apart in somebody else's hands so it's like i want it to be legit before it goes out there said and done like almost two plus years then from pronghorn beginning to it was in people's hands yeah i think that's probably about the timeline so waterproof, let's just talk about that waterproof versus water resistant. So you guys have been on a pretty big kick um, recently, and it's actually been for a while where you're designing a uh, waterproof bag. So completely like sealed seams or welded seams. Um, how important is that to Revelate? And how, do you, how important do you think that is for the bikepacking experience? I guess it just depends where you are and what you're doing before the whole waterproof you know revolution i guess it's like everybody still did a lot of the same things and they did it without it i mean i remember going on my first like backpacking trip and they showed me how to use a trash compactor bag and that was our waterproof you know bag i guess but uh i think people just like the carefreeness of just throwing stuff in there and that's it. They don't have to worry about it. They don't have to take that extra step to make sure it's, you know, ensure their like clothing or their protected valuables are like going to be out of the weather. So I, I think it's pretty important for them to do it for as far as like taking a bag that's not waterproof and making it waterproof. That's pretty easy to do, you know, as far as like putting a liner in it or something. But I think that's been a big push because that's what people kind of want a little bit. They just want 
they want to keep the simplicity, but they don't want to have to worry about like remembering the Ziploc bag for this or a trash bag for that. The non-waterproof bags still have a huge place. I mean, most of the winter, I don't think I use any real waterproof besides like the Hamabar bag. I mean, I still use the old Pika seat bag for my winter stuff just because it, it seems to work really well for that or it doesn't need, and it's freezing all the time so it doesn't need to be yeah snow is different than rain that's for sure <laughs> it's kind of the same but different i suppose yeah and like the waterproof the stuff that was made that is actually waterproof is like as long as you maintain it properly and like you know you, you can actually repair it and it's still waterproof and it's great you know it's like with um stuff that's like water resistant you know you know you get an abrasion on it it's like I guess it, it might be harder to like restore that water resistantness after you've like abraded it fully, you know, or something. It's like when it's waterproof, if there's a tear, it's pretty like, oh, it's like that's where my water is coming from. I'm just, I'm going to pass the tear and then it's waterproof. What is the number one request that you guys see coming in to the shop or on the website, I guess? Custom frame bags. Or the best is like, it's like, can you take the, the frame bag that you already make, like the Ranger and, uh, can you just add a little bit to it or change the color? I'm like, so you want a custom frame bag? Because that's that's what you're you're saying. So it, yeah, custom frame bags I think would be like hands down the <clears throat> the number one request that I get, or just like a custom of something that we actually make. Color requests, I, I'm sure. Color requests. Uh, people asking for. Um, can you sell me this product, but just make it four inches longer or, you know, you're like, okay. So yeah, customization of the product we have is probably the, the, the number one thing I see. And is that, has that dictated like any changes within what you offer? Like, I'm sure that would sway your perception as to like what to build. So like maybe like different size dry bags or something like that for the pronghorn or was that already in the plans once somebody brings it up enough and if it's actually like a feasible thing i mean i i mean i can't speak to it i don't know if we'll be like jumping on custom frame bags for everybody it takes a lot of time to do that and i, I applaud people that are able to do that and produce a lot of them but yeah, I mean, when they bring it up enough, we're like, okay, well, you know, let's let's address this or change something or just like maybe we can fit it in. I mean, we purposely released the pronghorn with three different sizes, you know, intended. And um, I was actually surprised to see like which ones were more popular than others, so, you know, designed that large pronghorn bag to fit like a negative 20 sleeping bag in there. And, you know, it's like nobody except for a few niche winter bike racers are going to want this. And like everybody really likes it. They're like, yeah, we can fit a ton of stuff in there. I'm like, all right. Yeah. So I also do like the warranty repairs. If there's something that like is the stitching's popping on something or something's coming loose or, you know, I, I, I guess I get to see all that firsthand and then address it if needed or, you know, just change something on it if there's a need for a change of anything. Um, and then also comes requests of this or that or could you guys make this or did you guys ever think about making this? And, um, and sometimes we do, honestly, like we've made a lot of bags off of people's requests and like I've had a couple bags that I've made that. I've used it and I've had other people use it and I'm like, there's just, it just doesn't quite work properly enough that, you know, it might work for like one out of 10 people, but I just think if you put it out there, a lot of people might have some issues with it. I'm sure when you were building the pronghorn, you were trying to test that or figure out how to maneuver around all of the cable and housing with like narrow bars and wide bars and just all the accessories like how challenging is that yeah I don't, I don't know it's hard it's like we can i mean i guarantee it's not going to fit everything but you can try you know we have got a pretty good relationship with like the local bike shops so i'm like constantly in there putting and mounting like the stuff on all their bikes um <clears throat> and we also you know here all ride different bikes it's like eric's got a bunch of different bikes i've got different bikes so we get to see them on there. And like, I think the fortunate for me is, you know, my wife, Christina is like, she's, she's a tiny lady. She has so many different issues with like mounting stuff. Everything is different. So it's kind of nice to see it work on her bike and, you know, but also work on everybody's. Eric and I both try to take that into account when we're putting them on there, but obviously we don't have every handlebar in the world and we don't have every brake lever set up but we can try to make it as best as possible we try to make it 
adapt for it, but it's yeah, at some point, you, I guess you can't, you know, like the pronghorn, it does, it fits, it will fit in drop bars, but you're going to either be using the large bag and then rolling it real tight and putting it on, which I think honestly is the best situation because you get that volume or, you know, that small one actually fits in like a, I think a 44 drop bar fairly well, but yeah, I mean, and then it's like, depends where people have stuff positioned on it and levers and then cables. I also help people get their bags mounted because they'll email and ask about it. And I think the biggest challenge for folks with the handlebar thing is like knowing that it's all right to route the cables around things. We try, we also try to make our bags compatible with all the other bags, which is also kind of a challenge too. But You have a whole other life in the Alpine world, uh, which is pretty awesome. And I want to kind of touch on that. But how has that shaped you? Has that helped you gain a, a different perspective on uh, designing bike bags at all? I guess it, no matter whatever like discipline you want to pick from, if you're like in the outdoors and you have to carry anything, whether it be in your back, bike, you know, anything, you realize that like, like I've got to go 50 miles and this is heavy and this kind of sucks. It's like, what's the old uh, ounces equal pounds, pounds equal pain? So it's like, I mean, I think the whole light and fast, which is like, you know, alpine biking, is it's everything really. Um, I think that contributed to it. Yeah. So I, I, honestly, I think it did help with some of it, just like having that light and fast mentality or, you know, as light as I could go comfortably with my abilities um, going into the bike thing. Because i that's the first thing I always do is I'll create a product and then I take it to the scale and I weigh it. And it's like, it's kind of a... Funny, like that, you know, that was always a goal to have like a full frame bag, seat bag and handlebar bag that was like within a pound or just over a pound complete, which is extremely difficult to do because, um, yeah, it, fabric weighs something. The other thing is I try to make things efficient, you know, transition times are like where you lose a lot of time, whether it be a race or just, just anything. You know, if you stop for 10 minutes, you know, five times or six times, that's an hour being able to just grab something, unbuckle it and go with it. That's kind of like a Alpine mentality too, where it's like, you got to be able to, to take your, take your j belay jacket off while you're like actually climbing. Cause you don't want to tell your climber to stop climbing. So it's like, what can you do like quickly? It's like the feedback. It's like, you don't want to stop and grab a candy bar out of there. So it's like, try to get it. So I, I think honestly, it's like the like light and fast to like the bike packing, I guess at least the ultra portion of it the racing is almost identical to like <clears throat> alpine climbing or do these big backcountry traverse trips. It's like you cut down brakes, you cut down the time you're like fumbling with it and you try to get the lightest product, I guess you can. What are some of your accolades as an uh, alpinist? You're, you're a, a guide or were a guide? Were, yeah, yeah. I haven't not done much alpine climbing the last few years. I was really big on to like bike alpine approaches. Um, which is still fun. I still like doing it. But as far as like going into like flying into the Alaska range and trying to climb like Alpine style routes on, you know, high altitude peaks, I, ha I definitely haven't done that in the last two years. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was great. Like I, I really enjoyed doing it. I really like being in the Alaska range um, or any of the mountain ranges around. And uh, yeah, I worked on Denali for almost a decade, I guess. Um, be a little shy of that. Um, and while I was actually working for Revelate, so the first couple of years at Revelate, I was actually, I would take off, I, yeah, I, don't, I should probably thank Eric for this too, but I'd take off for like three months and I'd go work on Denali and, uh, you know, God clients in the Alaska range and do personal trips. And, um, yeah, so it was, it was pretty fun. And uh, yeah, if you haven't checked, even if you come up to like Alaska and you go to Telkeaton, you should definitely fly, pay the money to fly in, to, even on a flight sea, it's like, it's such a different world out there. How many summits on Denali do you have? I've summited five times. Yeah, two different routes. I've been up like 10 times, but yeah, it, the weather usually beats you down. So. I have a friend that guides for RMI, and he's, I, I think he's attempted Denali twice, and he's had to turn around twice because of weather. What's the longest you've been kind of on the mountain waiting out weather? I've had some longer trips. I've had some like 24 day trips. Um, I, I remember I was at high camp waiting for weather to clear. I think it was 11 days 
my high camp. Yeah, it kind of it sucks up there. You definitely like, you're in a tent, you're tent bound, especially when the weather's that bad. And I remember at one point we needed to go back down to 14 camp. So like I went with another guy down to 14 camp, grabbed stuff, came back up. And then, you know, we were still stuck there for a few days. And then at some point you need to get down and then you're potentially stuck there because you can't even get down. I think I saw yesterday that you were working on some trail. Are you uh, doing a bunch of bench cutting these days or what for your free time? Oh man, there's so much stuff going on. Uh, so my wife and I have a, a bike guiding business. Oh, okay, cool. What's the, what's the company? It's Alaska Bike Adventures. We started it kind of midway through spring last year. Um, we actually launched it the day that I started the Highland 550. So it was kind of stressful. Um, there's not very good internet over there. It was kind of a startup. Um, this year was going to be our year to shine. And then obviously we don't have a lot of tourism right now of people coming up to bike. And then, uh, but sh she's doing great with like skills courses. We're teaching a ton of like mountain bike skills courses. And uh, so we've got that going on. And we're also trying to get some permits to guide in the Forest Service. So we're constantly working on things. And then um, the trail clearing came up separately. So this is another side project. Uh, so we've got pretty distinct climate up here where it tends to vegetation grows heavily. And uh, there's a lot of mountain bike trails that our local single track advocates is the nonprofit that has built and they're supposed to maintain. They were looking for somebody to keep the trails clear. So brushing back everything for sight lines and uh, I decided that I'd help out, and in order for me to do that legally with them, I had to actually start another business. After work at Revelate, I'll go and brush trails in the evening or on the weekends, and uh, yeah, keep it keep it cleared back. So that's what I was actually doing when you hit me up, and I was like, I'm a little busy, but yeah, no, it's it's like a jungle out there. I, I'm surprised. I I never really looked at it at the per that perspective, but it's like you know, five foot tall grass, and yeah, trying to push back all that stuff, but yeah. So it's it's um, I guess I guess my wife and I keep our time occupied. Well, in Alaska, you have a lot of time in the summer. Yeah, so that I mean that most people can't like leave work and then go work till ten thirty, and it's come back and have another two hours of daylight. So we're starting to lose it now, but it yeah. So the growing season starts tapering up too, so it's not not as big of a deal. But yeah, so just a lot of projects going on all the time. All right, I got one last question then. So tell us one thing about Alaska that most folks don't know, other than so obviously the time thing, we all know about that. Something unique. It kind of caught me off guard with that one. It's like the the it's like when people ask about the like cuisine of Alaska and I'm like, I don't know, salmon? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess one of the biggest things is like it catches people off guard is that we actually have like cities and stores and infrastructure. Like there are, there are built, we have Costco, we have, you know, car or Safeways. It's, it is a city, big city with, I mean, it's a small city with big city problems. We've had that, I guess, and you know, this, this comes back as a little more serious note to it, but I guess to answer the question is we do have, we do have a lot of homeless population up here. Um, it's something that surprises people, but it's, it's an issue that we're trying to help address. And like, I, I don't know, it's like the, the homeless and mental illness is, is, is a problem up here. Um, I know people don't think that you'd have homeless when we have such harsh climates, but you know, all joking aside, like that is something I don't think people realize that we do have a problem with still. So, um, Oh no, that's actually, it's a good tidbit <laughs> to add for sure. I think that's an important, uh, fact for everyone to recognize, uh, cause mental illness is everywhere and homelessness is in a lot of cities, especially where I'm at in Minneapolis right now too. So have you lived in Alaska your whole life? No, no. I've, I've been up here for 13 years or so. Yeah. I grew up in Pennsylvania actually. All right, Dusty. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I appreciate the time and, um, keep, uh, keep on trucking stoked for Revelate. And, uh, I'm excited to see, uh, see the next new thing whenever that comes out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for reaching out.